风云对话》新疆主题论坛第一集在京举行，三国驻华大使齐聚凤凰中心。You show to all the world the right strategy. 脱贫、抗疫、反恐、人权建设，关于新疆的多个议题。Human rights, genocide, they are interesting slogans. Mass killing and the intention of destroying. Does it fit the criteria? What has happened here in China has been good for the whole of humanity. 风云对话新疆主题论坛第一集正在播出。新疆，一座位于中国西北、美丽广袤的民族自治区。根据2020年人口数据，自治区常住人口两千五百万，少数民族人口占总人口的百分之五十九，其中维吾尔族人口占总人口的百分之四十六，共有五十六个民族成分。近年来，关于新疆的议题受到了国际舆论的关注，关于新疆报道的真实与谎言也频频见诸报端。二零二一年春，来自叙利亚、亚美尼亚、伊朗的三国驻华大使做客风云对话，参加关于新疆主题讨论的第一集。叙利亚驻华大使穆斯塔法于二零一二年抵华，在此之前，他有长达七年的驻美大使经历。穆斯塔法大使获英国萨里大学信息建模学科博士，后出任大马士革大学信息技术学院院长。亚美尼亚驻华大使马纳萨良也是一位资深的外交官，从1999年起便担任驻埃及大使 ，2016 年出任驻华大使，期间曾担任亚美尼亚外交部副部长。伊朗驻华大使克沙瓦尔兹扎德。于二零一八年开始他的驻华大使生涯，而第一次出任大使可以追溯到一九九七年，之后先后担任过伊朗外交部文化司、共同财富司、西欧司司长以及外交部部长助理等职。Good afternoon, Your Excellencies. Welcome to Phoenix for this special program for the place afar, not apart. As you can see, the setting is all about Xinjiang. Xinjiang is the largest province in China in terms of size, and it borders with eight countries. And it sits at the crossroads where the ancient Silk Road passed by. And today, we are very much privileged to have Ambassador Mustafa of Syria, Ambassador Manasarian of Armenia, and Ambassador Kashwazat of Iran. And sitting here under the grapevines here with us. So thank you very much for being here. Now, when I present the ambassadors, I present in order of seniority, which is the year ambassadors spent in China. And now, very briefly, I wish to introduce a little bit of the three beautiful countries, and I wish to do that in the alphabetical order, if I may. So, first, Armenia. Thank you. The most ancient Christian country in the world, the country that marked the human history with tolerance, with open-mindedness. With resilience, the secret mountain Arara on your national emblem is yes. believed to be the resting place of Noah's Ark. So it's a country that is mysterious, secret, and legendary. So Iran, Iran is the heir of the glory, the history, the magnificence, and the huge influence of the ancient Persian Empire, one of the greatest ancient empires of all. The diversity, harmony, and the wisdom of appeasement policies are believed to be the key factors to the success, to the grandeur and the greatness of Persian Empire. And Syria, whenever speaking of Syria, one can easily relate to the civilization, to the world heritage, and to the peaceful coexistence of religiousness and secularity. True. And one can also easily relate to the arduous and prevailing combat against terrorism in the last decade. So, three countries of civilization and wisdom. Welcome to you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, Ambassador Manasarin, you have been to Xinjiang before. 
So first of all, I would like to give the floor to you. Why has Xinjiang impressed you the most? Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, dear Satyan, thank you very much for invitation. It's the first time I visited Xinjiang approximately 10, 11 years ago before my posting here. I had not in any information about this region, just general, just general. But I see very interesting, uh, very interesting details. First of all, I fixed that this is, a, as you mentioned just now, uh, the biggest region in the China with uh, unlimited potential in economy. But at the same time, I smell, I'm so sorry, maybe it's not the correct, but I'm speaking frankly. I fixed the central provincial smell. Provincial smell. Mm -hmm. Yes. The rhythm of life was not fast, very slowly, calm. After my appointment here as ambassador in 2015, mm -hmm. close to the end of the year, I visited the second time Xinjiang. It was according to the uh, invitation from the local government. Mm -hmm. I was surprised. I was surprised because I saw the super modern megapolis. New kind of city transport. Plus, I fixed a lot of company registered in Xinjiang. It continued the, the process of registration, new companies. According to the result of 2020, total volume of investment in Xinjiang grew to on a 16% of a little more, maybe. Cities in the region are substantially improved, and of yes. course, it's easier for them to attract investments. Yes. And yes. then uh, everything can uh, improve yes. and enhance in a better You're way. Right. The change is fantastic. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much You're for welcome. the introduction. But it is true, actually, the Chinese government recently announced the victory on poverty alleviation nationwide. So I wonder, have you introduced a little bit of these, uh, you know, China stories or experience of the poverty alleviation back to your country, Ambassador? Yes, thank you. Um, this is a, a very important opportunity for us to discuss uh, a variety of topics upon alleviation of poverty is the most important. Actually, China has succeeded in an unprecedented historically way to alleviate poverty. If you look back to, to China 40 years ago and to China today, you would see that what China has done is a miracle of unknown dimensions. In no other time in history, in no other place in the world, has one huge part of the population been drawn out from poverty to become middle class and affluent. So this is a unique experience that every country in the world, without a single exception, should learn of. And this also includes not only countries like my country, a developing and struggling country, but also the developed world, in which huge chunks of the society are left in poverty. When we congratulate China on this success, we are actually congratulating the whole world because China represents one sixth of the whole world population. If you don't look at this country or that country, but you look at humanity as a whole, you would say what has happened here in China has been good for the whole of humanity. Mm. Thank you, Ambassador. And Ambassador, I wonder, what is your takeaway of uh, China's the poverty alleviation stories? About the poverty alleviation, I think this is the key point here is very important to look at that. The poverty alleviation, there was no discrimination policy mm. toward the regions. You know, if you look at the whole part of China benefited from the poverty alleviation, this is very important. Is not, for example, you say that uh, in the center part or maybe the south or east, the whole area benefited from the poverty alleviation, which is, I think, should congratulate uh, the government and the people of the China, which the, your president and uh, Excellency Xi Jinping mentioned. They should write in the history that the China, for the first time, was succeed for to eliminate poverty, the big gain, and it's a good uh, result which is very important and can provide a good opportunity for other nations to benefit from mm. that. So Ambassador Mustafa, you see some believe that poverty is one of the root causes of terrorism. What do you think of this? I agree, I fully agree on this. Ignorance, poverty, 
and the widespread of uh, radical, extreme religious ideologies have become the most important element to create hotspots of terrorism across the world. As you know, across the Islamic world, most of the Islamic countries follow a moderate, enlightened path towards religion. However, you have clerics and you have some states, unfortunately, that support an extreme radical interpretation of religious ideologies and this become a fuel in addition to poverty, to unemployment, and also to ignorance. And Ambassador Manasaria. You show to all the world the right strategy. You won uh, during the short period two battles. Mm. Two battles. Two battles. Yes. Against? Coronavirus and poverty. And poverty. Yeah. Okay. He's Maybe the, there's a third one too. Uh, which one? You, you created the base. You created the base for the liquidation, mm. the other negatives, mm. like uh, terrorism, extremism, is very important. Yes. Very. yes. So, Ambassador Kashwaza, how would you understand the origin of modern terrorism? As the ambassador mentioned, that uh, terrorism is uh, one of the main uh, problems of the whole world. It doesn't matter what kind of religious you have, what kind of ideology you have, what kind of terrorism is a terrorism. So it's uh, destroying the assets, it's destroying everything. Uh, as you saw uh, what they have done in Syria, it was on the name of the Islam, but it was not the real Islam. The Islam says something else. All region that they want to have the progress or to develop they need ed education is very important. So poverty alleviation and education opportunities. Yes, this is very important. Mm. Now, how do you think of uh, China's counter-terrorism uh, policy? What it means for the region? Uh, look, Syria, more than any other country in the whole world, was affected by the extremism and radicalization. And it's a great credit to China that China is educating and re-educating the young people in Xinjiang so that they can choose the path of development and the path of peaceful coexistence with everybody else. The policy that the government of China is combating the terrorism is uh, uh, successful, but not only for the people of the, the region, the Xinjiang, but whole region, even uh, for the Middle East, we, we, we counter a lot of problems. noticed that Mike Pompeo and the Canadian Parliament and the Dutch Parliament, they have defined that Chinese policies or Chinese government's conduct in Xinjiang as genocide. So first of all, I, I was not even sure if uh, this topic is worth so much uh, media attention because after all, it's uh, Mike Pompeo who represented only the previous governments. And uh, well, he basically made this announcement the very last day of his full office. And then it was a Canadian parliament and Dutch parliament, right? And uh, these stances were not even seconded by their government. And we know that their parliaments basically say whatever they like. But having that said, I find it strange to say the least that these countries would use such a strong word in this contest. So, Ambassador Manasarian. Uh, definition of genocide was given by UN after the Second World War, if I write. Mm. And everything is clean. It is uh, very delicate and uh, very painful for us. Because we are the nation who unfortunately had the genocide uh, in our history. It's a dark list in 1915 more than one and a half million Armenians were killed during this period. But if we are speaking about Xinjiang, uh, I want to just to mention one statistic that is. During the last 40, 45 years, Uyghur populations in Xinjiang doubled. Mm. What about we are speaking? Mm. 
we fixed uh, visible real progress in other directions of the social life, in the culture, education, business. So the second one, what about we are speaking? The answer is very clean. Mm. Yes, well, I think that's a very wise way to approach this uh, topic. That is, we start from the definition of the word, right? Well, I look it up in the English dictionary, to be honest. <laughs> well, the definition of genocide is the deliberate killing of a large number of people from a particular nation or ethnic group with the aim of destroying that nation or group. So the key factors would be one, mass killing, and two, intention of destroying the right. population. So, <laughs> Master Mustafa, <laughs> how would you reflect on this? Well, first let me say this. It is very clear that those who are using this term to describe what's happening in the Xinjiang province are just uh, using it as a political blackmail against China. However, this is outrageous and it's disrespectful of the true victims of genocide, like the victims of the Armenian genocide. Merely, merely having the temerity mm. of describing all the efforts that the Chinese government is doing in Xinjiang to build up the economy there, to offer employment, re-education, investment, infrastructure, trying to even educate, even on the religious aspects of the enlightened, moderate aspect of Islam, to the people in Xinjiang. And you compare this to the horrible genocide that took place in history, I think this reflects the mentality of the Western powers, their false sense of superiority. They believe that they are better than anyone. They can commit crimes against humanity across the globe. And yet, with all the sincere efforts that the Chinese government is doing in the Xinjiang province, they have the temerity of describing it as a genocide. This is, as I said, again, I repeat, outrageous and disrespectful. Outrageous by the sheer usage of this term mm -hmm. and disrespectful to the innocent victims of genocides across the world. On this topic, I've spoken to some uh, European ambassadors in China as well. Well, I don't know if it's a coincidence, but I don't think it is, that all the ambassadors, European ambassadors I spoke to, none of them believe what happened in Xinjiang was genocide. And when I ask them why those countries choose to use this word, they say, simple, it's a drive of populism. And I'm not sure it's the most politically correct way to think this, but I came across a report. It's trying to link the populism and the religion it's not difficult to notice that the three countries in question here, America, Canada, and Netherlands, are all Protestant countries. I have nothing against Protestants. <laughs> I love Protestants, you know. But they have a tradition of being bold with their personal ideas. Well, to give an example, there are Canadian institutes. They do the surveys, and they declare that Canadian government committed genocide against their own indigenous people. Yes. But look at the reactions. I mean, they're fine. The governments are fine. People are fine. Is it a cultural thing that they're so frivolous with this kind of strong word, ambassador? Yes. Uh, as you mentioned, the uh, word of uh, human rights, genocide, they are interesting slogans. I think uh, they are using as a scapegoat. They are hypocrites. Look at their history. For example, in the United States, the genocide happened in the United States, not everywhere. You know, the, the Indians there. So we know the history. Mm -hmm. And who was supporting the apartheid in the Africa? The, 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 the Dutch. Yes, the <laughs> Dutch. <laughs> and now the, the Canadian, you know, the people there in uh, Skimus, they were genocide by, by the Canadians. Look at the, even Australian, Aboriginal. Mm -hmm. Where are they? We know the history. I suggest them to go back and look at their history. Mm. And you saw the genocide happen, for example, in China, in Iran. Where, where? I suggest them to look at their history. And they are hypocrite. Uh, they are using this kind of uh, human rights or genocides or other things. Use this for their providing a system of, of the policy which oppress the other people.
since we're on this quite heavy topic, I wonder what would be your wise advice for China and Chinese people to handle this kind of a situation. When I was joking, you said that maybe there's a third battle. As a matter of fact, I mean, there's this media battle. When facing this kind of allegation, what do you think it would be the right thing for China or Chinese people to react? Ambassador Mustafa. Yes, thank you. I just want to say that as you have rightly said, the countries that were established mm. on the premise of genocide, like the United States of America, mm. Canada, Australia, and of course, Britain and England that actually sent the forces that committed the genocide at one historical juncture, are the countries that try to f point their fingers at others and say, no, not only us, other people, other nations are committing genocide. But as I said, this is outrageous. Instead of looking at your own crimes, you are creating and inventing crimes about the others. Now there is this media onslaught against China. Believe me, believe me. It has nothing to do with the Xinjiang province. It has nothing to do with Hong Kong. It has nothing to do with COVID-19. The reason the Western countries are so angry about China and they are doing everything possible to tarnish the image of China is that because China is a successful model that is an alternative model to their wild capitalistic model. They cannot accept the idea that another nation can follow its own paths and evolve, develop and become a powerful and affluent country. As long as China is successful, they will do everything possible to demonize and vilify China. Whatever you do, whatever you try to explain to the world, come and look at the situation in Xinjiang. Come and understand the actual situation in Hong Kong. Look at our spectacular success in dealing with the COVID-19 virus. They don't care. It's not really about these things. It's about the core issue. Why is China successful and why is China moving forward? They dislike this. And the only thing you can do to combat their attitude is to become more and more successful. So, uh, Ambassador Manasarian. Uh, so, uh, usually we support the Chinese position in international organization and we have very good level of uh, relation with China. And like in previous times, during the last session, we sent the special message or a special statement by our ambassador uh, during the session. And with your permission, I will read a very short yes. part from that. Non-politicized, constructive and inclusive debates are essential for the promotion and protection of human rights. Therefore, we are convinced that any best discourse cannot serve the genuine purpose of improvement of human rights situation on the ground. Human rights issues must be addressed through cooperation and dialogue. We maintain one China policy, commend China's efforts towards the promotion of the right to health and the environmental rights, as well as its determination to eradicate poverty and to create job opportunities. Very short. Very short, but comprehensive. Um, yes, <laughs> to the point. Yes, yeah. yes. succinct. This is yes. a state position of the states. Mm. Continuation of this short part from the statement. When we are speaking uh, about this very delicate issue, it's necessary to remember for all of us to try to be far, so far from the double standard. Besides that, don't forget that the tense of this sort struggle you mentioned source struggle, mm -hmm. directly depends from the level of development of China, mm -hmm. particularly economical development. Right. Ambassador Manasarian, thank you for reading You're the welcome. letter. And you reminded me of last year. I remember it was 33 countries that of the UN uh, human rights, they addressed a letter condemning China's Xinjiang policy. But soon after that, there are 54 countries actually signed to praise or support China's policies in Xinjiang. But most of the countries that actually support China's policies in Xinjiang are Muslim countries or Arab countries. How do you reflect on this? So it, it shows that the reality, you know, that mm -hmm. as you said, that the Protestant you know, countries, they have the experience of uh, genocide and uh, human rights violation. Now they want to support what? 
Uh, I'm a Muslim and uh, the people from other uh, regions, which they are close to here. So they understand what the situation is. The countries that criticize China for its alleged human rights abuses are practicing human rights abuse on a large scale in Syria. This is really an ugly hypocrisy. In my country today, the Western powers, particularly the United States, France, and England, are preventing the Syrian people from buying food and medicine, even in the COVID epidemic, mm -hmm. uh, when we really needed to buy ventilators and medicine and uh, vaccine that, because of the sanctions. Yes, that remind me of uh, what your late foreign minister, Mr. Malam, used to say that the economic sanctions equals the economic terrorism. Economy, yes. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. This is economic terrorism. And in, if, God forbids, it continues and continues and continues, it will lead to economic genocide. These are the countries that are practicing. Okay. Mass killing and the intention of destroying. Does it fit yes. the criteria? Because if you <laughs> prevent people from having food mm -hmm. and having medicine mm. and having means to live with dignity, what are you doing then? We have also the problem of the sanction. We cannot provide even the medicine for our people, you know. We have a money, we want to pay, we want to buy, but they say, they're hypocrite. They said, okay, the, the medical or the medicine is not under sanction, but they close the banking channel. So if you want to buy, for example, from Switzerland, you want to buy a medicine. You cannot. You cannot pay. So it's a genocide. I think since last year, there's dozens of companies in Xinjiang are being sanctioned as well. I uh, don't remember in my mind even one case in history, modern history, when uh, the policy of sanction bring uh, the positive results. Just negative. When the policy of sanction just uh, have a a huge influence on the social level of the population, not more, not more. To talk with world leaders has become one of the most important political programs not only in China, but across the world by those who observe, study, and analyze China. The Phoenix TV is one of the serious channels, and not only for China, for the whole region, Asia Pacific region. Uh, this program uh, providing the whole story, and not the part of the story. Foreign Dialogue, Xinjiang Theme Discussion, next week.